In part two of chapter five, the main topic is Chris's relationship with his father. Is it a quality relationship or is the narrator's proclivity for intellectual engrossment and aloofness a problem? Is it a good idea to take a 10-year-old kid on this kind of grueling motorcycle trip? Is he treating him too much like a young adult or is he giving him appropriate challenge? Chris has challenges of his own. Is the narrator meeting these with compassion, tough love, both or neither? At the end of this chapter is a section I want to address mostly by reading it in its entirety and adding some comments. So let me just briefly summarize what happens up to that point at the end of the chapter. We begin with this. Chris's expression shows he is really settling into something bad. This has been a long, hard day. I told Sylvia way back in Minnesota we could expect a slump in spirits like this on the second or third day, and now it's here. So there is a short encounter with a drunken woman, which could be amusing, but ultimately is not. There's no chicken man situation here. This is sort of like an encounter with a habitual drunk who is in denial about her behavior. Just, it's depressing, and he indicates it is. The three adults are all completely stupid with exhaustion when it's time to make camp and Chris is beginning to act up. The dark is approaching before they can really even set up the camp, and these difficulties make the camping experience unpleasant. And all this enhances the already uncomfortable mood of the party brought about by Chris's erratic behavior. He has one of his little scenes, as the narrator calls it. What follows is a description of Chris's behavior that the narrator indicates as a pattern. Chris is irritable, inconsiderate, he ignores, he ignores his father and generally behaves in his father's terms like a bastard. Also, his stomach seems to chronically hurt during these scenes, and this turns out to be a symptom of something that isn't exactly physical. He's been examined half a dozen times for it, but they found nothing. Nothing? No, but it happened again on other occasions, too. Don't they have any idea? Sylvia asks. This spring, it was, they diagnosed it as the beginning symptoms of mental illness. Now, this is an interesting diagnosis because nowadays, if you had uh, a kid diagnosed with something psychological, you would never say mental illness. You would say it's ADHD or it's opposite ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, or it's anxiety or it's depression. Um, and honestly, and I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I almost think the blanket term mental illness is sometimes more apt because these categories, especially um, especially with kids, but in general, too, especially things like bipolar, um, there's a sort of arbitrary nature to these categories because the meaning of the behavior can be very different even though objectively it might kind of look the same. Not always, but sometimes the old way is better and this is one of the themes of the book, by the way, just that sometimes the old way is better. I'm glad you told us. John shoves some unburned ends of the wood into the fire. Sylvia says, what do you suppose the cause is? John's voice raps as if to cut it off, but I answer, I don't know. Causes and effects don't seem to fit. Causes and effects are the result of thought. I would think mental illness becomes before thought. This doesn't make much sense to them, I'm sure. It doesn't make much sense to me, and I'm too tired to think it out and give up. Thought is influenced by a lot of factors that are in place before thought can even emerge, uh, cognitive factors and otherwise, even temperamental factors. So say someone's depressed, um, then you're likely to be more negative. Your thoughts are likely to be more negative. So say you have something like schizo, uh, schizophrenia, then your thoughts are likely to be through that lens. They're likely to be you know, delusional or paranoid. Uh, so that is sort of an example of mental of you know mental illness before thought. I don't think this is what the narrator means, but but that's something that I was just thinking about when I read that. 
So to reflect on what the narrator says here, is it the context or the circumstances that dictate what is mental illness? Is it the culture? In another time, an anxious per person um, would have been more likely to outrun a predator. Let's just say, you know, on the savannah, at the dawn of man. And that same anxiety in this time is a disorder. So, so the shaman is the wise man in one culture and institutionalized in another. I mean, haven't, haven't people <laughs> said that Jesus would be in the psych ward if he came back today? And we've often heard the phrase, there is a fine line between genius and insanity. So we can put up this ethereal boundary between what we most revere and what we most revile. So maybe that's something um, like what he's saying. What do the psychiatrists think, John asks. Nothing. I stopped it. Stopped it? Yes. Is that good? I don't know. There's no rational reason I can think of for saying it's not good. Just a mental block of my own. I think about it and all the good reasons for it and make plans for an appointment and even look up the phone number. And then the block hits. It's just like a door slams shut. So there's a theme here, and at risk of stepping outside the boundaries of these reading videos and getting into other person material, making a conscious decision not to not get mental health treatment is something that will figure into to Persig's life and work. And this may very well have to do with the contextual issue I just mentioned, at least to some extent. So let me ask you a question. Insanity or enlightenment or both? That doesn't sound right. No one else thinks so either. I suppose I can't hold on forever. But why, Sylvia asks. I don't know. It's just that I don't know. They're not kin. Surprising word. I think to myself, never used it before. Not of kin. It sounds like hillbilly talk. Not of a kind. Same root. Kindness, too. They can't have real kindness toward him. They're not his kin. That's exactly the feeling. Old word. So ancient, it's almost drowned out. What a change through the centuries. Now anyone can be kind, and everyone's supposed to be, except that a long time ago it was something you were born into and couldn't help. Now it's just a faked up attitude half the time, like teachers on the first day of class. But what do they really know about kindness who are not kin? So his observations about hillbilly talk um, is, are accurate because that's, that word is, um, it's not just in German, it's also in, in Old English. And in Albion Seed, which is a, a book about it's an acclaimed book that demonstrates how the folkways that were transported from Albion, which is the old word for England, um, the hillbillies origin was Irish and Scottish uh, people whose culture back in England was fiercely independent and they did not want authority in their business. So um, when they arrived in the U.S., they headed for the hills where they could be isolated. To them, kin and clans were of utmost importance, and they were still tribal up until the middle of the century. My mother spent a lot of her childhood, in fact, most of her childhood, in hillbilly country and reported exactly this. Um, so as an aside, my mother had a tremendous amount of respect for, let's just say, this community, and never spoke disparagingly of them. And... Um, so I've noticed that the same people who object to the word hillbilly have no problem with the word deplorables. So it's interesting that the narrator evokes this kind of homespun tribalism and takes on this attitude with a seemingly type of unconscious decision to keep the care of his son and the family. It's like something's keeping him from, um, from calling the doctor. He wants to keep him in the family where, where, where Chris will be understood, where he will be treated with real kindness. But is Chris understood by the narrator? And also, unconsciously, spontaneously, in that it is going over and over in the narrator's thoughts. Um, there is a narrative, a poem, that illustrates this kin, not kin, dynamic or, or thought process that's, that's you know going on in his head. 
It goes over and over in my thoughts, mein Kind, my, my child. There, is, there it is in another language, mein Kinder. I'm going to try this. Wer reitet so spread durch Nacht und Wind. Es ist der Vater mit seinem Kind. I hope I got that right. Strange feeling from that. What are you thinking about, Sylvia asks. An old poem by Goethe. It must be 200 years old. I had to learn it a long time ago. I don't know why I should remember it now except the strange feeling comes back. So what strange feeling is that? I think you're starting to see something here. How does it go? Sylvia asks. I try to recall. A man is riding along a beach at night through the wind. It's a father with his son whom he holds fast in his arm. He asks his son why he looks so pale and the son replies, Father, don't you see the ghost? The father tried to reassure the boy it's only a bank of fog along the beach that he sees and only a rustling of the leaves in the wind that he hears, but the son keeps saying it is a ghost and the father rides harder and harder through the night. How does it end? In failure, death of the child, the ghost wins. Um, the name of the poem is El, El König, which means elf king, and the ghost is the ghostly elf king. Schubert put this poem to music, and I have a wonderful animated link uh, below in the description for that. So just turn off the translation on the CC button, and a, and a nice English translation will come up. Also, I think it's interesting that he uses the word failure. The wind blows light up from the coals, and I see Sylvia look at me startled. But that's another land and another time, I say. Here life is the end, and ghosts have no meaning. I believe that. I believe in all this, too, I say, looking at, out at the darkened prairie, although I'm not sure of what it all means yet. I'm not sure of much of anything these days. Maybe that's why I talk so much. It seems here he's trying to reassure Sylvia in some way. Who knows where her mind could have gone after this, um, after this segue into this poem. And as we did see in chapter 3, how indeed ghosts didn't have meaning ultimately, no matter how absolutely positive we are that certain ghosts are real. The coals die lower and lower. We smoke our last cigarettes. Chris is off somewhere in the darkness, but I'm not going to shag after him. John is carefully silent and Sylvia is silent and suddenly we are all separate, all alone in our private universes and there is no communication among us. We douse the fire and go to the sleeping bags in the pines. With a revelation such as this one, such as, you know, uh, Chris's condition, this changes the entire context of the situation. And when we have uh, a, a piece of information like this, you know, we sort of have a shift in how we see things. And we need to face the shift of reality and regroup. And this is why, why they go silent. This is what they're doing in silence. There will be nothing more to say of this old world. Now there already is this new bit of information. Tomorrow there will be a new way that the three adults will be looking at the father and the son and the trip. I discover that this one tiny refuge of scrub pines where I have put the sleeping bag is also the refuge in the wind of millions of mosquitoes from the reservoir. The mosquito repellent doesn't stop them at all, so I crawl deep into the sleeping bag and make one little hole for breathing. I am almost asleep when Chris finally shows up. That sounds like a nightmare. There's a great big sand pile over there, he says, crunching around in the pine needles. Yes, I say. Get to sleep. You should see it. Will you come and see it tomorrow? We won't, we won't have time. Can I play over there tomorrow morning? Yes. He makes interminable noises getting undressed and into the sleeping bag. He is in it, and then he rolls around, and then he is silent, then he rolls some more. Then he says, Dad? What? What was it like when you were a kid? Go to sleep, Chris. There are limits to what you can listen to. Really? Later, I hear a sharp inhaling of phlegm that tells me he has been crying. And though I'm exhausted, I don't sleep. A few words of consolation might have helped there. He was trying to be friendly, but the words weren't forthcoming for some reason. Consoling words are more for strangers, for hospitals, not kin. Little emotional band-aids like that aren't what he needs or what's sought. I don't know what he needs or what's sought. So this is an interesting thing to say from someone 
who is kin. Kin should know what is needed. Why is the narrator so perplexed? It sounds to me like he can analyze Chris, but in some way having difficulty connecting to him. Why wouldn't an emotional band-aid like consolation, like words of consolation, be kindness? Or is the narrator unsure what is the kindness that is appropriate of Ken, and what is just the emotional band-aid of a teacher on the first day of school? Why does he seem reluctant to console, as he says, for some reason? It strikes me as a little unkind. What do you think? A gibbous moon comes up from the horizon beyond the pines, and by its slow, patient arc across the sky, I measure hour after hour of semi-sleep. Too much fatigue. The moon and strange dreams and sounds of mosquitoes and odd fragments of memory become jumbled and mixed in an unreal lost landscape in which the moon is shining, and yet there is a bank of fog, and I am riding a horse, and Chris is with me, and the horse jumps over a small stream that runs through the sand toward the ocean and somewhere beyond, and then that is broken, and then it reappears. And in the fog there appears an intimation of a figure. It disappears when I look at it directly, but then it reappears in the corner of my vision when I turn my glance. I'm about to say something, to call to it, to recognize it, but then do not, knowing that to recognize it by any gesture or action is to give it a reality which it must not have but it is a figure I recognize even though I do not let on. It is Phaedrus, evil spirit, insane, from a world without life or death. The figure fades and I hold panic down, tight, not rushing it, just letting it sink in, not believing it, not disbelieving it, but the hair crawls slowly on the back of my skull. He is calling Chris. Is that it? Yes? The elf king is the ghost who wants the child because the child is so beautiful. He wants him for his own son. Is Phaedrus calling Chris like that? Like he was Ken? So just as an aside, on the audiobook, gibbous was pronounced gibbous. This upset me a little as it meant I had to alter 30 years of H.P. Lovecraft in my head, but I was pleased to discover that both pronunciations are used. Mm -hmm.